Today, in denial, are Auckland sellers swimming down a river in Egypt? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And also, of course, a New Zealand flavour because I have Joe Wills with me. Hello, Joe. Hi, Martin. Now, there's some really interesting stuff going on around the Auckland market and uh, some of the things you were talking about last year appear to be coming true. Yeah, it's, um, well, it's happening very, very quickly. And uh, we're now getting the data that uh, I thought we probably wouldn't see until February starting to come through and the, the numbers are uh, uh, presenting uh, interesting reading. Indeed, yes. And um, I, I don't know whether the mainstream media have woken up in New Zealand yet to what's really going on or whether they're still trying to talk the bubble higher. But uh, I guess you'll talk about that as we go through. Yeah, we're getting little, little bits and pieces, little snippets. There was an ASB um, confidence survey issued yesterday, uh, which uh, uh, suggested for the first time in five and a half years that buyers are considering it a good time to buy. Um, obviously, that's ASB's view on things. Um, we also had some uh, interesting news about a uh, Kiwi build development in the Waikato, uh, where they're trying to sell properties off plan. Um, and uh, not a single person has uh, actually applied to register their interest. So, um, yeah, we're, uh, we're starting to see some interesting things. But um, I thought today I'd run through uh, an update from New Zealand on, on some of the things that are happening monetary policy wise and then and talking about some of the statistics that we're now getting out from uh, Real Estate Institute of New Zealand. Right. Go ahead then. That sounds uh, that'll be very interesting. OK, well, we've got a little bit of a script today, so we'll call this one In Denial. Are Auckland sellers swimming down a river in Egypt? Um, so on Wednesday, 13th February, we had the monetary policy released from the RBNZ governor, where he painted a non-committal picture of the interest rate policy settings moving forward. Um, the guidance presented a fairly opaque synopsis of future moves in interest rates, with Mr. All saying once again that the, one, the next move could be either up or down. However... What was interesting was that the timeline for the next interest rate move, either up or down, has now been pushed out to 2021. Previously, the timeline had suggested a decision as being sometime in 2020. Is that good or should it be a concern about households' financial positions? Um, it's just my opinion, but this suggests to me that the governor is very well aware that the 258 billion of household mortgage debt and nearly 450 billion of total private debt that includes businesses, farms and construction, is, as an aggregated amount, a major concern to the New Zealand economy and that any step by the RBNZ to move towards higher interest rates could make the debt burden puke all over the economy. The RBNZ monetary policy statement was again full of discussion about the housing market, which does make sense when you consider that the combined lending to households and the private debt in the property sector makes up over 70% of the total debt pile. So what did the governor say? RBNZ Governor Adrian Orr says central, the central bank has historically low level of house price inflation projected. Overall, forecasts are for national house price growth of around 2% moving forward. He went on to say that that is over the three-year projection horizon. His quotes include that, of course, this is for the whole country rather than just Auckland. Auckland is a big component of giving us confidence that it will be on average that type of low nominal growth across the country. Auckland, without doubt, negative, the rest of the country, or many parts of the rest of the country, still strongly positive on average. It's a good outlook, he said. Asked about how far prices might potentially go, or said, we don't project a particular Armageddon in house prices in New Zealand because there are so many factors that are supporting that asset class at the moment. But we would say that investor perceptions are being tested at the moment. I found it quite funny, Martin, when um, Mr. Orr mentioned uh, Armageddon. <laughs> I couldn't help think whether it had been watching some of Mr. John Adams' posts. Well, perhaps, you know, it gets about. To close the RBNZ, RBNZ section, here is the RBNZ's forecast for national property price inflation moving forward. I think, given the recent steep decline, that they may be being a little bit optimistic. So how did the markets react? Well, the Kiwi dollar strengthened significantly on the news, so the markets were obviously expecting something different leading up to the announcement. The strengthening of the New Zealand dollar would suggest that maybe a cut in the official cash rate was already anticipated and short sellers got panned. So what do I think? I think we'll still see a cut in the RBNZ official cash rate. 
from 1.75% within the next six to 12 months, and that the governor will sacrifice the New Zealand dollar so that consumers, so consumers should prepare for some important inflation over the next 12 months. Here is my reason why. Auckland house sales have plummeted, both in terms of average prices, but more significantly volumes of transactions. And for an economy that relies upon buyers and sellers trading debt with one another, flipping houses, buying kitchens, carpets, bathrooms and other upgrades, the low volumes of transactions in the market will be very worrying to the governor. Why do I say this? Well, yesterday, the REINZ figures were published for January. I don't know if the governor had heard news of this prior to the statement, but the numbers paint a very gloomy picture, particularly of the Auckland market. Let's run through some key statistics. Firstly, the REINZ median sales price for Auckland in January plummeted 7.3% from the median price achieved in December. Now, January is often a slow month and prices are regularly lower than the December before, which begs the question, why would anyone sell in January? But the fall in the median at Auckland sales price this January takes the median price achieved back to levels last seen in 2016, with a median Auckland selling price of $800,000. Anyone who bought since then is likely to be facing paper losses now on their purchase price. Secondly, the drop in Auckland prices has been very different to the normal January decline, not just in the magnitude of the drop, but the drop compared to previous years. Now, we mentioned it out more from the New Zealand property market post in November, how the marginal buyer impacts all transactions. And I'd like to share a chart that shows the extent of the price falls between December and November over the last few years. Now, you can see the prices in December 2018 were actually up on November, November last year. That in itself is unusual, but let's not forget that many deals that were done before the foreign buyer deadline of the 23rd of October may have had a long stop on when they completed. Hence, when the transactional value was subsequently recorded, this could have boosted the November and early December sales figures. The plummet in January 2019's median values looks very similar to the January plummet in 2008, which had also been a positive December increase in prices during 2007 point I'd like to make is that of sales volumes in January, which were remarkably low, but particularly in reference to turnover relative to the supply of homes for sale, which is the highest number it has been in January for several years. Remember, we New Zealanders have had the housing shortage myth rammed down our throats by the media for several years now. If there is such a shortage, then why are there so many months of stock sitting unsold? Let me highlight this for you with some numbers. REI and Z numbers show that there were 1,152 homes sold in the Auckland in Auckland during January, which was down 2.8% compared to January last year, and down from 1,395 last month, a 17.4% decline. A look at the availability of homes at realestate.co.nz on Valentine's Day shows that in Auckland there are 13,569 houses, units, and land and new homes packages looking for the love of a buyer. Or at the January rate of sales in Auckland, 1,152 transactions, that provides stock for over 12 months of transactions already for sale in the market. Trade Me's Auckland listings is really interesting to look at, as that shows one sorry 13,094 Valentine's Day listings. That is, until you get to page 11 of the search results, and all of a sudden the number leaps up to 14,156 Auckland listings. So actually, there's even more stock looking for Valentine's partner. And if not a single new listing came to the market, there's enough stock at current rates of sales to last well into 2020. This sparks of a major trouble ahead. And I've never seen anything like this in any housing market that I've studied over the last 20 years. And yet, apparently, the median days to sell for Auckland is 51. I don't understand how that works. According to REINZ, six days higher than January 2018. Now, this doesn't make sense to me. And given how much stock there is for sale, it makes me question whether the REINZ are also swimming up a, reef, a river in Egypt. Secondly, according to REINZ, nationally, excluding Auckland, the average median price fell to $473,300, down from $480,000 in December, a 1.4% decline. There were 3,220 sales around the country, uh, excluding Auckland, down from 4,158 in December, a decline of 22.6% over the month. The average time on market was, according to REINZ, 46 days, 
with no change from the same month last year. Again, that doesn't make sense to me because realestate.co.nz figures for available, availability, excluding Auckland, shows 23,427 available listings, or at the current rate of sales, there's stock available for nearly eight months worth, and that is if not another single house was added to the market. Unfortunately, trade me broke in August last year when national listings first went over 32,000, so I don't have those numbers to compare. I think it's safe to say that everyone can ignore the average time on market statistics provided by REINZ because they're wildly incorrect and must be getting provided by the final agent involved who actually sells the house. They can't be taking into account all the houses that obviously aren't selling. From the REINZ report, point number three, Auctions were used in 4.6% of all sales across the country in January, with 203 properties selling under the hammer. This is down from the same time last year, when 5.5% of properties, 248, were sold via auction. This is the lowest percentage of sales by auction for eight years. It's very interesting that Barth and Thompson's auction results page broke a couple of weeks ago, um, and for a week I wasn't able to get the data from, uh, from their auction results. Um, it seems to have been fixed now, but there are very, very low levels of auctions taking place. Um, fourth point, again from the REINZ report, the number of homes sold for less than 500,000 across New Zealand fell from 47.7% of the market, 2,137 properties in January 2018, to 42.7% of the market, 1,865 properties in January 2019. The number of properties sold in the 500,000 to 750,000 bracket increased from 27.5% in January 2018, 1,232 properties, to 31.7% in January 2017, 1,386 properties. At the top end of the market, properties sold for a million dollars or more decreased from 11.4% in January 2018, 509 houses, to 10.5% in January 2019, 461 houses, or a decline in essence of 10%. It appears to me from these numbers that the top end squeeze has started in New Zealand, as you've seen in Australia over the last year. Um, and what we're probably finding is that there's some exiting of invest investment properties at the lower end uh, with more availability there. Uh, I still find incredible that there are so many houses that are coming to the market when you've got such an overhang of supply. Uh, that are being listed without prices. Um, buyers don't have a clue, um, and obviously the sellers don't have a clue where to push the, uh, position their properties. Um, in summary, it would appear that the market has changed. Sellers may be in denial, and many agents appear to be struggling to educate their clients about what's happening. If that sounds like your business, and you're an owner of a real estate company wanting to improve the understanding of your agents, then do please get in touch with me on LinkedIn. Buyers, hold the power now, and they want some truth. How does the market in New Zealand look? I'd say that the change in the credit environment means that we are in for some very interesting times, Martin. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Very interesting. And, you know, it's so mirroring what happens in Australia, right? You're, you're behind us, but, but uh, the same sort of dynamics seem to be playing out. Yeah, it's been it's been quite pronounced, and and just the the, the drop off in acti activity. The, the the listings are are rising on a daily basis. Um, the, the the sales numbers and and just you know I've I've never seen uh, in in the UK in the markets that I've I used to um, I guess monitor and investigate. I've never seen over a year's worth of stock um, present itself to the market. And, and 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 all you have to do is look. What's the current rate of sales? Um, how long is that going to take to, to, to sell the stock that's, that's there in the marketplace? So buyers um, have got the power now. Uh, it's their decision whether they choose to uh, move into the market now uh, or wait, perhaps. Mm. And the other observation is it's funny how all the stats start sort of failing and, you know, you're getting delays of information coming out. Whereas when markets are rising, everybody wants to sort of fall over themselves to get the data straight out. Right. But but we're, yeah. we're finding now it's much more difficult. And, you know, you've got to dig a lot harder to get data because a lot of people are suppressing, I think, the most recent data. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Martin. Um, the uh, I suppose the, the websites in New Zealand, we've got uh, homes.co.nz, we've got One Roof, we've got realestate.co.nz, uh, um, Trade Me Property. Um, the information that was readily available last year, I might have mentioned this before, but Trade Me Property um, had a property insights tab, which uh, when you looked at a property on your smartphone, it would provide you with the sales history of that property. So you could look back, what did it sell for in 2016? 
uh, 2005, what did it sell for in 1999? And, and you could see the, see, the, see the movements in the price. Uh, and you could do that. So you could look at a house that you might, might be interested in. And very quickly, that data was there. Um, you now have to go and search for it because they've taken that facility away. It's, it was a facility that they they, they lauded um, this time last year as a, a new thing to help help consumers or help the buyers. Um, but they've obviously switched that switched that function on. Um, I wasn't sure. Uh, I mean, with with things like trade when when they got stuck at thirty two thousand listings last year, um, when it was obvious that the listings were rising exponentially beyond that. Uh, whether it was just a, a system error with their, their, their uh, database provider limiting how much how much data they could have on, um, and then when you look at things like the Auckland the Auckland bit, which I mentioned in this post, you go from thirteen thousand something listings, but by the time you get down to page eleven, it's it's rocketed up another thousand listings. So there's a lot of things that are a bit opaque. And um, for buyers who want to get information, QV uh, does seem to be the the best place, credible value. Um, so you can still search individual properties and their, their selling history. Uh, buyers are going to have to do a, an awful lot more work uh, to get the data now. Uh, we'll try and provide bits where we can. Um, but yeah, it really is a marketplace where buyers, buyers do need to get a lot more focused on, on their investigations. Mm. And as I said in a recent post uh, on should I buy now and should I sell now, do the work, right? So basically, it's really, really important to do that research to really understand what's going on because you, you really cannot take the high level news and assume it's correct because essentially it's much more complicated now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's still lots of uh, stuff. I mean, I was I was looking at stuff.co.nz yesterday. Um, there was a really interesting uh, piece about the fall in uh, Auckland prices. Didn't go into the specifics of how big the fall had been. I mean, this is the first time I've seen a year-on-year fall. So January, yes, the numbers were lower last year. So it's a 2.4% 2, 2 annual decline January to January uh, and the monthly dec decline quite dramatic. But um, what I found quite interesting was that that news article appeared for an hour or two on the, the main stuff website. So it's quite a big article. Everybody talks about property New Zealand. To be fair, it's the only thing that people talk about sometimes. Um, and very quickly, it was disappeared off the front pages, hidden in the depths. And the main focus was on a story about how rents are going up in Wellington, So, um, which, which obviously stayed at the top of the news site as the the, the driving force for the property market for the rest of the day. So we've um, we've got some yeah some clouded information presenting itself. Obviously, lots of uh, vested interests in the in the banking sector, um, and you know I think from a from a real estate perspective, um, as real estate agents, and, and I've I've worked through this. You do have to become uh, very analytical. You do need to provide a lot more data to your clients, um, and there are ways that you can work. Because you know markets go up, markets go down, and people can still achieve very good outcomes um, if they if they start focusing on, on on what the what the agenda is behind the move rather than necessarily the nuts and bolts of I can't do anything until I get this price. So um, that seems to be where um, I, I suppose there are there are an awful lot of agents in Auckland. Um, you know, Buff and Thompson alone, seventeen hundred representatives uh, only 1100 sales across the whole of Auckland so that's including all the other companies there'll be a lot who aren't selling anything um, and these are the people that, that need help to understand how how this um, how this market functions mm, it's a new world and uh, what's quite interesting of course is that um, if you are an owner occupier and you want to trade up or trade down you only need one property right so effectively wherever the market is you can still do that, right? Because effectively you win on one side, you lose on the other side, right? So, but if you're an investor, that's when it gets really, really complicated. And certainly all the data that I've got here in Australia, and I suspect over there too, is it's the investment sector that's really going to struggle now over the next few months. Yeah, I think the people who are moving for a genuine reason, I mean, I, I worked through the credit crunch in the UK. I remember uh, a client of mine who uh, in March 2008, he had a, a bid of 1.1 million. He'd actually had eight offers on his house. This is just the, uh, about a week before Bear Stands collapsed. Um, by the end of the year, we sold his house for 740,000. It could have been a disaster, um, but no, it wasn't because he bought another house for similar money. Uh, which had also come off the uh, come off the top of the market, and um, that was a you know I guess a 25 30% correction over eight or nine months. Um, I don't know whether we'll see that type of correction. I'd like to think that was a once in a lifetime event, mm -hmm. but um, people can still move, providing the agents are understanding of, of how this market functions. Yeah, and that's really the point, isn't it? And we'll keep on preaching the gospel of get granular, 
understand what's going on, use the information that's available, and ignore the high-level headlines of saying, it's all doom and gloom, or it's all great, because actually reality is way more complicated. Absolutely, yeah. And people's individual circumstances are way more complicated. Absolutely. Joe, I really appreciate your time today. Most interesting. Thank you very much. Good to see you, Martin. Thanks very much. See you next time. Cheers. So there you have it. A very interesting perspective from Joe Wilkes in New Zealand, and we'll track that market as we go ahead. And it amazes me again just how eerily similar the Australian and New Zealand markets are becoming. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. If you like this post, please share it, add a comment, a question. I read them all. And if you haven't subscribed, please do so to receive future alerts. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.